Okay, how's everybody doing? Did your heart get touched in that wonderful praise and worship time? Praise the Lord. Okay, so we are going to dive into our second topic tonight as we are plowing through the great doctrines of the faith. Now, if we were here for the first topic, we ask and answer the question, who is Jesus? Remember? We covered all that he is, all of his claims, why we could believe him, why he is who he said he is, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, the second topic that we're going to get into tonight is this issue of the afterlife. Now, what happens when we die? What happens when we die? So we're really, we're going to talk about the realities of heaven and hell, but we're going to start with hell first. Now, some of you may get uncomfortable with this study uh, because we live in such a touchy-feely society and such a touchy-feely politically correct age that anything that having to do with absolute truth and anything difficult to hear People just say, well, if, as long as I don't believe it, it won't apply to me. Or that's mean-spirited, or that's this, or that's that, and all the nonsense that you hear. But the fact of the matter is, if you speed, you break the law, policeman pulls you over, it is what it is. Absolute truth comes to bear in your life, doesn't it? In the form of a hefty ticket. Now, what happens if you tell an officer... Oh, I didn't know. Well, if they have a gut feeling that you actually didn't know and you're from maybe out of state, then you may get a free pass, verbal warning, written warning. But how many of you know it in many instances, they say, listen, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Okay, so we see that even on a natural level, the laws of the land come to bear in the form of absolute truth hitting your wallet and points against your license. Now, when it comes to God's laws, there's very few people that can truly claim ignorance because if they don't open the book, uh, then what they don't know is their own fault for not knowing it. Say, so, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't ever read the Bible. I'm not, uh, well, listen, all those laws that you're not reading about are binding in your life. So it greatly benefits you and behooves you to know what's in here because you are accountable and will be answerable to all the stuff that's in here, whether you choose to be knowledgeable about it or not. So it's a very, very important thing here. We serve a holy God. There's a holy God that created the heavens and the earth. His name is holy. His name is faithful and true. He is the awesome, awesome, majestic King of glory. And anything that violates His law violates His holiness. And it's an affront to His very character and nature. So, because Adam and Eve started that whole violation, if you will, in motion, the Father sent His only Son to die on behalf of people, to pay for the sins of the world. But just because on a theological level, on a spiritual level, those sins are paid for, that doesn't mean that everybody on the planet gets to benefit from that unless they first come to the one who paid the price and bow the knee to him so that his blood can cover their sins on a personal basis. See, it's true in a general fact, as a general fact, but to apply it on a personal basis how many of you know that insurance is true as a general fact? Insurance exists, insurance companies, and you, that you need insurance for your vehicle. Everybody knows that. But whether or not it applies to you is based upon whether or not you contact an insurance company and pay for that insurance. So that means it's available, but not available to you unless you go there and make the connection. So forgiveness is available, but it's only available if you go to the one who paid the price to allocate it. 
If you don't, if you believe that there's another way up this mountain, you do so at your own eternal peril. And this is really what this is all about. So we live in a generation that doesn't want to hear about hell. It's amazing how many people want to hear about heaven and believe they're going, but they can't even tell you why. But very few people say, I'm going to hell. Yeah, of course I am. No, instead they rather self-medicate and deny that hell exists. Or read a partial understanding of Scripture and try and make God... Uh, make one understanding, one dimension of his character understood as the whole, which is God is love. And how could a loving God ever send somebody to hell? You see, that's one facet of his character, but God is righteous. He is just. He is holy. Not just love, but he's all those other things too. I want to just read you one scripture as we launch out tonight. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, I'll give you a minute to turn there so that you know where this is. Because I'm telling you, I created these outlines. I'm giving you this information in a very clear, systematic manner. Number one, for you. And number two, so that you can take and keep this material and minister to other people. Because there's so much misinformation and deception, and blending, and mixture that's out there, even in what's called Christianity, that you better have a clear understanding of what the Bible says, and not just a bunch of fables. So I'm giving it to you straight, and I don't want you to take these outlines and throw them away. If you're going to do that, just do it now and get it over with. But if you're going to stay here for the sessions, then put these in a folder because if you pray and if you're doing what you're supposed to do, the Holy Spirit's going to have you minister to people. And you're going to find that a lot of what you get covered, you're going to minister out of in people's misunderstanding of God, the Bible, and everything else. Jeremiah 9, 23. Thus says the Lord, he said, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, in other words, don't let him think he's all that. Let not the mighty man glory in his physical strength, nor let the rich man glory in his riches as though his riches are going to get him somewhere eternal. But let him who glories, glories in, glory in this fact. If someone has anything to boast about, let him boast about these realities. First, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord. That's the first place to start, right? He's not just your buddy. He's not the big man in the sky. He's not a bunch of saints. He's not this and that. He is the king of glory. Now, he exercises what? Loving kindness. That means covenantal loyalty. That word loving kindness is a term that means covenantal loyalty. But he also exercises what else? Judgment. Other translations have the word justice in there, but it's the same feeling. It is the exact same thought. Justice is on the basis of right judgment. When things are judged rightly, that's why justice occurs. You with me? So he said, if you're going to boast about something, boast first of all that you really know who the Lord is, not who you thought he was. Second, that you understand that he is multifaceted in his expressions, in his character, and in his nature. The first of which is that he exercises loving kindness. That means he is loyal, and he is faithful, and he is a God of covenant. And that he exercises that loyalty to those who love and serve him, even unto a thousand generations. The second thing that we can boast about, if there's any boasting at all, is that we understand that he's also a God that exercises judgment when judgment is necessary. How many of you know that if you go somewhere and you say, let's say, I don't know, I like the show Jeopardy. I like it. So when somebody buzzes in, now obviously in that show they have to answer in the form of a question, but let's just say the content of the information, when they give the answer, Alex Trebek either tells them that's correct or 
no, sorry. <laughs> and they get that money taken away from their account, right? Boy, Alex is such a mean-spirited guy. They should have gotten a trophy for participating. Boy, he's mean. He's intolerant. He ought to go to sensitivity training. <laughs> Trying to tell someone they're wrong. Well, they are wrong. There's only one right answer, and that ain't it. They'll just have to get over it. How many of you know that when he tells them wrong, or when he says, right you are, it's a judgment? Judgment doesn't mean it's subjective based upon Alex's opinion. The word judgment means to put the gavel down. And in a courtroom, when the judge puts the gavel down, it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> you just better hope the gavel lands in your favor. You know what the, the word judge means? To divide through. It's a word, diacrino. It means to judge, to divide through a circular realm of logic. That means in the circular form of logic, everyone's opinion goes round and round, but judgment cuts through the baloney and puts a gavel down. That's why the word judgment cuts through nonsense and opinion. How many of you knew that? Good. Okay. Now, he says first, I exercise loving kindness. Boy, we all want that. Uh-oh. He also exercises judgment. Oops. And he exercises righteousness in the earth. Now, guess what he says last? In all these expressions of my sovereignty, I delight. I delight in doing all of those things at the appropriate times in situations. Now, as I said before, the primary reason why we're visiting all of these doctrines, and we're going to go one by one, is that there is so much deception out there. I've never seen it the way it is now, even in the body of Christ. It's unbelievable how much foolishness and fleshliness and compromise and feel-good kind of trip has bled into what should have been solid theology. And it has watered it down and messed it up. If you ever read a book by Rob Bell, don't. He wrote a book, Love Wins. This guy, Rob Bell, has gone off the wall. He's gone off the deep end. And this book, Love Wins, really espouses universalism. That at the end of the day, the reason why love wins is because Jesus paid the price on the cross, and therefore, everyone will be saved. And in his view, that's how love wins. That's deception, and that's heresy. But this is a guy that started out okay. Now he's off the rails. Why? Because he got, he got bitten by this political, politically correct bug. And he's letting that nonsense infiltrate and bring a, a um, what's the word, a virus into sound doctrine. So he's off the wall. He's a heretic. Now, so I don't want that for you. And I don't want that for this church. It's not going to happen. And we are going to visit these doctrines, and our roots are going to go deep, and you're going to know what you believe and why. If you don't, we get through these, and you don't, it's because you, you spaced out through it. That's your fault, not mine. But you're going to get a steak every time. You want Twinkies, go for it. But you're going to get steak served. You're going to have to sneak your own Twinkies in. There are many people that are watching this movie, The Shack. Sounds good. But let me read this report from the guy that was instrumental in making The Shack artistically. Um, the covered artist behind The Shack now has deep regrets about ever having been involved in the project that has captivated millions of people, right? Deep regret. Here's why. 
He said, the movie release of The Shack, now this is him speaking. He said, the reason why I'm broken over the fact that I ever got involved with this thing is this. The movie release of The Shack has brought all this back to my mind, and I felt the need, and I feel the need to apologize to all who I have met may inadvertently have led astray by promoting the book in the first place, which now has become a movie. I look back and I see how little discernment I had for ever getting involved in it. And I regret and I apologize also for waiting this long to publicly share this apology, Dave Aldrich wrote in his Facebook post. Aldrich says, author Wayne Jacobson approached him in 2006 about designing the cover and the other artwork and the interior pages for the book. Uh, blah, blah, blah. In 2009, he praised how the project impacted his career path, and he said he was blessed with the opportunity. Of course, once the guy did the work for the book, you know, he was in demand everywhere, so he made a lot of money. Eight years later, however, as the movie version of the book claims financial success, Aldrich said he's been convicted by the Holy Spirit about ever having been involved with his work. Embracing the shack as I did, says Aldrich, led me to other books, other authors who had started out on the straight and narrow, having solid biblical beliefs, but have now strayed off into apostasy land. That means deception and heresy. Rob Bell, Jim Palmer, Brian McLaren, to name only a few, by whom I was once inspired. That inspiration led me to the edge of this universalist belief that it is embedded in the shack. I thank the Lord that he has now pulled me back from the edge of deception. The shack's wonderful, has the story wonderfully painted this picture to me, now listen, here's why, of an incredibly knowable and loving God, one full of forgiveness, but one who's never judgmental. And we just read that God takes delight in judgment when judgment's necessary. The fact is that there are two or more inseparable sides to God. He is both love and judgment, says Aldrich. And that's where I missed it. Wow. Again, this thing, now here's how he finishes. Again, this thing called free will has given us the ability to willfully accept God's gracious gift of his son Jesus, who died on a cross to save us from our sins, or use our free will to willingly reject this gracious gift. Jesus did die for the sins of the whole world, but tragically, most of the world has and will refuse him. So when you get into a movie that really doesn't have sound biblical doctrine as its underpinning, it misleads people as to who God is and what he's about and how and who he really is. He doesn't live in a shack and smoke a corn cob pipe or something like that, you know. Now, I want to read just a little bit of this other article about Christians foolishly tapping into New Age lies as the great falling away continues. That's the name of the article. George Barna did a study and found many Christians strongly agree with worldviews. Now, listen. Many Christians strongly agree with worldviews that contradict biblical teachings. That contradict biblical teaching. I'm a Christian, but I don't agree with the Bible. That's it. In other words, many believers are believing flat-out lies that sound good. He says, consider these startling statistics about practicing Christians. Surveyed, 38% are sympathetic toward Muslim teachings. That's almost one out of two Christians. 61% agree with ideas rooted in New Age spirituality. 61%. 54% resonate with postmodernist views. 36% accept ideas associated with Marxism. One out of three Christians are closet communists, but don't know it. 
29% believe ideas based on social secularism. 29, that's almost one out of three Christians are closet secularists that own a Bible. And millennials and Gen Xers are most likely to fall for these heresies and deceptions. And males are most likely to believe the nonsense more than females. I mean, the Apostle Paul wrote, and we started with the Scripture at the beginning of this whole series, 1 Timothy 4. He said, now the Holy Spirit clearly, specifically says that in the last times, some will depart from the faith by paying attention or taking heed to seducing spirits and doctrines inspired by devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy and wind up having their conscience seared over as with a hot iron. Wow. Now, my question would be, how do you depart from the faith if you were never part of it to begin with? It's sort of, uh, yeah, impossible. But Paul, prophetically seeing ahead, said by the Holy Spirit, watch out, there's going to be a great falling away that takes place. And it will be because people give their ear to seducing spirits. That means the work of deceiving spirits, but they sound good. It sounds convincing, but it's emotionally driven and not biblically based. Doctrines of devils. That means the teachings like Rob Bell and others. No, that kind of love doesn't win. And one of the biggest deceptions going in our day and age is this universalism that everyone will be saved as long as they're sincere about their beliefs. That the truth about the beliefs is secondary. Sincerity trumps truth. Well, that's nonsense. How many of you know that I can get on the on-ramp for 91 North and I believe with all my heart that I'm going to New Haven? But I'll wind up in Vermont before I wake up. Hello? Hello? Well, wait a minute. I believe with all my heart I'd be going to New Haven to modern pizza. <laughs> Yet I wind up in Vermont. That's not fair. I was sincere about my beliefs. I was sincere but sincerely wrong. See, I was sincere about what I believe, but I wasn't basing it upon accurate truth. And it got me to the wrong place. And so will unbiblical thinking and operation. Now, that's why Paul said there's going to come a time when people will not tolerate sound doctrine anymore, but they're going to gather themselves teachings, teachers in accordance with their own desires because they have itching ears. You know, there's this message of hyper grace that perverts the gospel. This is another deception of our age that everything is grace. Everything is grace. Yeah, there's grace, but there's also the truth of law. There's, you know, understand that grace without truth is just sloppy without boundaries. Truth without grace kills people because of legalism. But grace without truth is sloppy and has no boundaries. So there's always going to need to be a balance between grace and truth. Listen, I don't know about you, but when we were raising our kids, when our kids got out of hand and they, they didn't listen, you know, I had to discipline them. I had to give them a spanking. Not because I was mean, because I loved them. I loved them enough to have to straighten them out before one day they don't listen and get hit by a car. You understand the stakes go up. They got to be taught to listen, listen, listen. Listen, because one of these days you could get hurt or killed because of that same I don't have to listen attitude, the stakes go up. So was it because I didn't love them? No, it was because I loved them. And that has to be respected. You know, Francis Chan is a wonderful pastor and leader, and Francis Chan said this about hell. He said, Jesus didn't speak of hell so that we could study, debate, and just write books about it. He gave us the passages about hell so that we would live holy lives in the fear of the Lord. 
Jesus evidently hates it when we tear into our brothers and sisters with demeaning words and words that fail to honor people around us in the image of God in which they're created. Now, I want to just one more quote by him. He said, it's incredibly arrogant where people pick and choose which truths they're going to embrace. No one wants to ditch God's plan of redemption, even though it doesn't fully make sense to us. Neither should we erase God's revealed plan of punishment just because it doesn't sit well with us. Because as soon as we do this, we are putting God's actions into submission, in submission to our own reasoning, which is a dangerous, deadly, and ridiculous thing for any human being to do. Whoa! So there's our introduction. Now let's get to work. Guys, this is true stuff. All right, we're going to talk about the after, afterlife, and I don't know how many sessions this will take, but we're going to go through it. See that guy? He's looking down the big tunnel. He better be going to the right tunnel, not the East Rock Tunnel. All right, no. So the afterlife, here we go. Let's go now into your shaded boxes on Roman number two on your notes. These are the objectives here that we want to bring about as a result of these teaching. And there it's in your notes, it's also on the screen, to give you a deep understanding and gratitude for God's rescue from, from the certainty of an eternity I should have put without him. Yeah. Over here I put eternity with him, sorry. Let's go to the second objective that we want, to change the way you think about yourself and others from a focus on the here and now to a focus on eternity. If we can do those two things through this study, we're going to be really happy. All right? Now, you know, there's, there's studies have proven that there's a great deal more interest in the afterlife now than, than even a few years ago. Every year it seems to increase people's desire to want to know what's on the other side and where they're going to go and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> so why are we studying this? Because the Bible has a lot to say about hell. Do you realize that Jesus had a lot more to say about hell? Two things. Hell and money are the two most popular topics of the New Testament. Heaven has very few mentions. Hell has a whole lot. That means we need to sit up and pay attention to what Jesus talked about a lot, and the apostles talked about a lot. So the Bible has a lot to say about it, and the second reason why we do that is that other people has a lot, have a lot to say about this. You know, everyone has an opinion about death, everyone has an opinion about the afterlife, but they better be basing those things on accurate truth. Because there's a whole lot of people getting ideas from half-baked authors and new age gurus and all this kind of weirdos and freaks and People are getting ideas from all over the place. And if you listen, if you watch how people are on talk shows and all this kind of stuff, you, you hear one common theme? People are revered as deep and awesome if they're spiritual. Well, they're spiritual, all right, but they got the wrong spirit. Listen to how many people go on talk shows and they talk about... Um, you know, Pilates, and they talk about yoga, and they talk about their spirituality. Well, I'm a really spiritual person. Well, what spirit are you of? See, if you're not of the Holy Spirit, you're of some other spirit. <laughs> when somebody says, if someone can't say I'm of the Holy Spirit, you are got a problem, buddy. Well, you do have spirits, all right. See, the fact of the matter is, I don't care what Oprah has to say. I care what the Bible has to say. <laughs> so we want to talk about what the Bible says about hell. I, think, I want you to think about the fact of the gift that God has given her in, this, in the sense of the global stage and all the people 
that she's going to be accountable for having made stumble away from Christ. Woo! Woo! I don't even want to contemplate it. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 4, it's an interesting scripture. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 4. It may sound like a little strange scripture, but there's a point behind it. Ecclesiastes 7 and 4 says this, A wise man thinks much of death, while the fool thinks of only having a good time now. Now, what does it mean that we should be hung up about death and always thinking about death? No. What he's saying is someone who has wisdom has enough wisdom to understand that there's more to existence beyond the realm of time that they better be paying attention to, and that death is the thing that unlocks the door between time and eternity. So I better be paying attention to death because if I'm paying attention to death, I have respect for that doorway. Therefore, I want to make sure that I'm on the right path that's going to lead me through the proper door. That's where it should take me if I'm a wise person thinking about the reality of death. Not in a morbid sense, but in a sense of wisdom. If death is a reality for everyone, then how am I planning for it? Am I just hoping that somehow it will work out? Wrong. That's as foolish as saying I'm going to live till I'm 500 years old. Well, I'd like to. But yeah, but you're not going to. So if death is going to be a reality, how are you planning for it? Well, I just try and be a nice person. <clears throat> Wrong. Well, I try and volunteer. <clears throat> Wrong. None of those answers matter unless you bow the knee to Jesus and trust Him to be the way, the truth, and the life, you are on the wrong track. There's only one way to the throne. There's only one way to heaven, and it comes through Him. He's the door. He's the gatekeeper. So let's go to Roman numeral three now. <clears throat> We're going to ask and answer a bunch of questions related to hell. So here we go. We don't have a lot of time, so is hell a real place? That's the first question. Is it just an allegorical thought? Is it just symbolism? Is it, listen to this, is it a state of mind? Some people say it's a state of mind. A lot of people believe <clears throat> that, listen, my life is hell. Hell is here. Once we slug our way through this life, it's all good from here. Well, that's a deception because, listen, not because I say so, but I want you to listen to this biblical logic. If this were hell, then Jesus would have never taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer the way that he did. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth exactly the way it is in heaven. He doesn't mention anything about hell. God's will is not being done in hell other than having created hell and chucked everybody in there that needs to go there. Outside of that, it's not like the Holy Spirit's evangelizing people in hell. Once someone draws their last breath and goes there, it is game over for good forever. So when Jesus said, look, here's the way you pray. Pray that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth exactly the way it is in heaven that's because this is not hell. So that's just silly. That's people talking out of hurt, and woundedness, and bitterness. But our opinions on the existence of heaven and hell are interesting. These were questions answered by Time Magazine reporter. Let me read them for you. <clears throat> Do you believe in the existence of heaven? where people will live forever with God after they die. 81% of people surveyed said yes, only 13% said no. Do you believe in hell, where people are punished forever after they die? 63% of people said yes, 30% of people said no. But the fascinating part of this study is that even in our non-judgmental age and touchy-feely age, 63% of people somehow still believe that there's a place called hell. Ironically, though, most people think that they're not the ones that are going to go there. That's the irony. 
But Jesus was very clear about these teachings. Jesus taught that hell is a real place of judgment. It's a real place of judgment because, as I said, there are more verses where he talks about hell than heaven. So let's look at a couple of these verses. Jesus talked about the unrighteous people, people that are not found covered by the blood of Christ when they draw their last breath. They stand in judgment, and here's what he said. He said, the righteous I'm going to take and bring them into glory, but those over here, they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous will be gathered unto eternal life. And then look at the second scripture. Is it up there? Good. John chapter 5. Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. Now listen, by believing in Christ, you have passed from death unto life. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good will come forth to what? To the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That means eternal judgment. See, the Bible speaks of a time of judgment that all human beings will have to go through. Every single human being. It's referred to in several different ways in Scripture. There's a, it's referred to as a separating. It's referred to as a gathering. It's referred to as a, a sorting the righteous from the unrighteous, the separation on the left hand and on the right. And... Uh, in Matthew 13, it's illustrated as a dragnet catching fish. And then when the fisherman puts his net up onto the shore and all these fish are in it, some get separated here, some get thrown back, and some get gathered in. And then in Matthew 25, there's a, the uh, illustration of the sheep and the goats. When the whole herd is gathered in, the sheep are brought in here, but the goats are kicked out. Goats are always symbolic of rebellious people that rebel against authority, beginning with God, but even uh, going down into human authority. The goat nature is a nature that bucks and kicks and destroys. So, so the Bible gives all these word pictures for us. All right, so who gives the judgment? Who's the only one who judges and does this separating? Jesus. He's the only righteous one, and all power and authority are in his hands. You see, Jesus is at the center of everything, and everything that we teach about hell, Jesus is at the center. He's at the center of this moment of separation and judgment. In Acts 17, verse 31, Acts 17, 31 says, For he has set a day... For justly judging the world by the man he has appointed. That's meaning Jesus. And he has pointed him out by bringing him back to life again. So the Father has set a time when all things and all people will be judged. And he has given that judgment into the hands of the one that he brought back to life. Powerful, isn't it? In U.S. News and World Report, one guy wrote this. Many modern Christians are simply ashamed of hell. In, in, in an increasingly secular American culture, as this professor, hell has become about as politically incorrect a concept as one can find. Hell, he quotes, has all but disappeared and no one's even noticed. Well, guess what? The Bible still notices. There's a place called hell. There's a real place. But why? Nothing, has, nothing can be created apart from the hand of God. Then why would a loving God create such a place? If he's only love in the sloppy sense, then why could a loving God ever create this place? So let's just cover this last point. Here's the reason. Hell was not created originally for any human being but for Satan and his angels. And you might want to put the word fallen in front of the word angels. See, those are the angels who followed Satan or Lucifer, as he was known, 
when he tried to lead a rebellion against God in heaven. So they got the boot out of heaven, and guess what? They were banished to earth until such time when they'll be banished from the earth into the lake of fire. But until Jesus Christ returns again and judges mankind and these spirits, Satan still is free to do his dirty work here in the earth. Now, let's look at two scriptures and we're going to finish up. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. In this time of judgment, then the Lord will say to those on his left, depart from me. For you are cursed. Depart from me into the eternal fire. Prepared for whom, though? Originally prepared for the devil and his angels. See, because God's heart is love, he didn't create hell with mankind in mind. Because if he was going to create hell with mankind in mind, then he certainly would have never had to send his son to pay a price so that people don't have to go there. If he created hell with man in mind, and it was a no-win situation, then why did Jesus have to suffer all that? All that he did, if people are going to go there anyhow. So then how do people, in effect, go to hell? By rejecting the Son of God, they send themselves there. It's like a person in a flood zone who's on a rooftop, and the waters are rising, but they have a particular boat that they're waiting for. In the meantime, three other little boats come around. Civilian boats, but they're waiting for a special Red Cross boat. And these civilian boats pull up next, next to the house and say, uh, come on, jump in. No, I'm waiting for the Red Cross boat. And by the time the Red Cross boat gets there, three boats have all pulled away, and now the guy drowns. So in effect, because of his foolishness and presumption, he sent himself to destruction because he didn't get in the boat that came to save him. So, look at the next bullet point. So, contrary to popular opinion, Satan is not yet confined to hell. Well, Satan is in hell. No, he's not confined to hell. Satan now resides somewhere else. Oh, yeah. In fact, he resides on most university campuses. Four times in the Gospels, Jesus refers to Satan as the prince of this world. The prince of this world. You know, I love it. Satan may be the prince of this world, but Jesus is the king of glory. And the king wins. <laughs> and we'll just finish here. Look at John 12, 31. It's on your notes there under point two said Jesus was talking about his time, about ready to go to the cross. He said, now is the judgment of this world, and now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Other translations say it this way. Now is the time for judgment to come on this world, and now the prince of this world will be driven out. You see, Satan can live apart from God on this earth. But guess what? There are many people living lives separated from God in this world now. That's the choice Satan made when he rebelled in heaven and one-third of the angels were foolish enough to go with him, thinking that can actually unseat God from his throne. But a third of the angels went with him. That means that Lucifer is very, very cunning, crafty, and persuasive. Is it any wonder why multiple billions of people are completely deceived? Wow. Let's just do this last blank then. Let's blank number three. <laughs> One day, according to the book of Revelation, God is going to cast Satan, death, and Hades into the lake of fire. One day... God's going to cast Satan, death, and Hades into the lake of fire. And there's two scriptures right on your notes. Revelation 20, verse 10. Then the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented 
day and night forever. Listen, when people say, yeah, I'm going to hell, all my buddies are there, we're going to party. There'll be no partying in hell. Hell will not be a party. In fact, when they reach the gates of hell and everything turns into the thickness of blackness beyond any human comprehension, and Satan takes them by the hand and drags them across that point of no return, he's going to say, you fool. Now I own you. You believed the ultimate lie. A, that God was not who he says he was. B, that the Bible is not what it says it is. And C, that I'm not as nasty as I really am. Now I have full legal rights to your soul forever. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's pretty intense, guys. You don't have to rejoice in this by any means, but it's a fact of life. It's a fact of time. It's a fact of eternity. That's why Jesus came. He said, if you'll bow the knee to me and trust me to be your way, the way, the truth, and the life, bend your knee to me, do my will, serve me, love me, then I'll make sure that you never have to go to that place. But if you go your own way, all bets are off. Wow. Okay, thanks for paying attention tonight, everybody. Come on, let's stand together. Amen.